Hello and welcome to the Mutts and Mischief Coffee Hour and tonight we have on Colin Spence of Colin's Canine Training. Colin, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everybody, my name's Colin Spence. Um, I'm the founder of Colin's Canine Training Services. We um, do a lot of classes and one to one of behaviour work and scent work in the Essex area. Um, we've been going now for the last 13 years. Excellent. So what kind of things do you do within your canine services, Colin? Well, we do puppy, puppy classes is what I tend to specialise in the most. So we run classes in two different, three different locations on a Saturday and Friday evening. Um, the classes are not based on the kennel club. Because I find with the kennel club stuff, you, you, you can't tweak it or modify it for people that are um, struggling um, or they have um, mobility issues. Yeah. So we run something very, very similar. So in our classes, it's a, how can I put it, a conjunction of basic social and life skills in conjunction with a bit of free work. Um, bit of specialization, yeah, and then we put them all together, and it's a six weeks course. So basically, at the end of the six weeks, we should have <laughs> we should have um, puppies that are able to learn, concentrate, and focus, meet and greet other puppies, and without being called, just gravitate to owner and go back to their owners. Um, they can walk around the class and there is no gravitating towards each other until they've all been cued, go meet, yeah? And the greet and meet is only literally for three seconds. Yeah. Uh, and it's an absolute um, pleasure to watch, um, you know, because I've got some fantastic trainers, awesome trainers. It's a pleasure to watch um, when I go in, because um, I don't, I'm not always at the Friday class, but I'm always at the Saturday class. To see how they just come along. I'll meet them for the first time when they first when the class is first start. When I go back round about fifth week, I'm always there for the um testing thing, for the, the testing. And it's amazing just to see the puppy who was barky, the puppy who was pulley, the puppy who wanted to go and meet everybody, now being able to regulate himself, yeah, with his little waggy tail, say hi, oh, we'll speak in a minute when we bump into each other on the walk around. Um, so, yeah, it, it's um, a pleasure to, to run those puppy classes. On top of the to puppy classes, we also do scent detection work. Um, and that's headed by Sarah. And that's just, that just blows my mind. Yeah. Puppies, scent work. Yes, yeah, I, I could just talk and talk and talk. Watching dogs do what they do best naturally is amazing watching how they use that olfactory system um we also do reactive classes um which is headed up by emma and that class just amazes me you know when you because i tend to do a lot of the consultations prior to these dog guys coming into the classes just to make sure everything's going to work out and be safe and around about week four, it's amazing when I get the videos um, back to just see how the dogs are now slowly learning how to focus um, and process, which is a huge one where a lot of dogs just can't process what's going on around them because there's just too much going on through them. The yeah. trigger is there and it's making them feel very uncomfortable. Um, but watching them around about week four and five, how they just they can look up, uh, like seeing a dog or other human, yeah, that they were once um, what's the word perturbed by, and then they go back to their snuffle mat or their Mickey mat or the Kong or all the little sentry stuff that Emma's got out, and you think, wow. Why can't I do that when I'm upset? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a pleasure to watch. And we also do I deal with a lot of aggression cases on the Saturday afternoon. So people will come to me um, basically um, for one-to-one -one assessments 
and they will come from either all around Essex or um, further afield um, just to do have an assessment or regarding their dog's behaviour. Um, and in most cases, we're looking at resource guarding yeah? uh, and resource guarding of people who own them. Yeah. Um, and the, a huge dislike of dog, but this is a little bit more than what we would say reactive. And I don't like the word reactive, I like the word socially challenged. Yeah. Um, so these dogs are biters, they're going to bite. Yeah. yeah. So I work with those on one to one on a Saturday. Um, and that's about it. That's really good. That's awesome. Yeah, I especially love the layout of your puppy classes as well, because it's so important. Like, obviously, you guys know that we've massively moved away from the idea of puppy parties and all that kind of stuff. But still, a lot of people have stopped doing that kind of stuff or set up and do that kind of stuff. Would you like to explain to the listeners, like the guardians who are listening, about the importance of attending a class that's set up your way for a puppy rather than attending like a puppy party at the vet's office? Puppy parties. If I go back, oh, blimey, that was six, seven years ago um, when I first um, started to work with one of our local vets. Um, it started off as a puppy party, but I soon realised this can't work because there is no good, there is no good communication going on because all these puppies are all running around. And the owners are all chit chatting and talking, and I couldn't concentrate. Um, so the following week, um, having spoke with the um, vet staff, we changed it completely. So we changed it from uh, puppy parties to puppy advice workshops. Yeah, this was at the vets. Then that gave me an idea that when we start doing classes, um, I'm going to have the classes so that they're more structured, but fun. Yeah. Because without some form of structure, it becomes mayhem. Yeah. So puppies running around loosely, just playing and running around and jumping on each other, play fighting, can be absolutely detriment and have a major impact on their well being, or some of them, yeah, not all of them, because all those play styles are so, so different. Yeah. Um, if you've got a, and this is nothing to do with um, no bad um, lives regarding um, Staffordshire Bull Terriers, but I will always remember. This little staffy, beautiful puppy she was. And she was running around doing what she would normally do for her breed. Yeah. Playing very, very rough. And then I can't remember, I think it was a Westie or a, a Cairn Terrier um, was being absolutely pestered and, what's the word, knocked around by this staff. And I said, we're going to have to separate these guys now simply because it can't go on. If that play continued, we could end up as the Cairn Terrier ending up disliking dogs at a later date. Yeah, exactly. Or we traumatised at an early age. Yeah? yeah. So puppy parties for me are a no-no and they shouldn't really happen. Whereas a, if you're going to have a group of puppies together, have some kind of structure to it. You learn them to teach them how to meet and greet. Yeah. If you match up the puppies in that little setting with the same or particular um, play style, yeah, that's better because two Staffordshire Bull Terrier puppies playing together is far better than having a Staffordshire Bull Terrier playing with the Yorkshire Terrier. Yeah. yeah. Even if they are 13 or 14 weeks of age, there's a difference in their play style. Um, and, and we should be looking out for the dog's mental health as well as their physical health, especially at that age. Yeah. Because <laughs> If we go, if puppies are going home at 13 or 14 weeks, um, what's the word, not with a positive experience, then you're probably going to have a dog that is six months, nine months old, not wanting to leave the front door. Yeah. yeah? Um, so it's very important that these classes are structured. Um, I hate the word puppy parties anyway, um, that they are very structured. And the person in charge of them, for me, should be qualified trainer or a qualified behaviourist. That's also important because a lot of these places, um, individuals will take these classes and have no idea about the body language. Yeah? And for me, having worked with so many puppies over the years, 
I think puppies give a much clearer signal about stress and distress, 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 more than the older dog. Yeah. yeah. Who may ride it for a little bit, put up with it for a little bit before they say enough's enough. The puppy who's got their tail tucked between their legs, running behind your legs, running away, running around. And if that kind of play is continued where the, the chaser is always chasing yeah, and the runner away is always running away, that's a clear indication this is not fair or good play. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, because you see that a lot on social media as well, don't you? That people put videos and they find it hilarious that their puppy is chasing another puppy to the point where the poor puppy is run absolutely ragged because they are fearing for their lives. And a lot of people don't understand that because dogs aren't specifically prey animals like a rabbit, it's not an okay behaviour, is it? And we can get trauma early on at a young age. And then, as you said, like six to nine months, then you start to see that they don't want to leave leave the house so for people who don't attend puppy classes that are well structured and set up properly how would you advise uh guardians to work with their puppy to expose them to the environment and socialize like on walks and that kind of thing okay so anyone that's not attending classes that's um working with their pup at home so that exposure for me, anyone that knows me knows I take my time about how I expect my dogs. I'd rather go over than under the exposure. Yeah. So even just walking out of the front door can be a lot of exposure for a new puppy. It would just be that sound of the vehicle or, or, or the sound of someone closing the car door. Um, and, and depending on the, what part of the country you're living in, what time your dustmen arrive, yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, so I would say find out the times of the, these things, such as the dust cart. What what days the dust cart arrive, and start to rent your puppy out well before those times. Yeah, yeah? so they're not getting exposed to that heavy um, noise of the lift as it takes the bins up. And um, if you've got a road that's a busy, busy road, try and take your puppy out at a time where it's before it gets too busy, or even on the main road, so to speak. Um, slow exposure to other dogs. Yeah, for me, when puppies are going to meet other dogs or puppies, it's a very good idea for the owner to be able to match their puppy up with the right dog. Yeah. Yeah. Preferably a dog that is more in control of themselves, that can regulate themselves quite well and naturally, and is happy to be around a puppy. It's going to give that puppy a good, good time. Yeah. And uh, dogs that can handicap themselves, yeah? Dogs that can actually say, okay, I know you're smaller than me, so what I'll do is I'll come down to your level, yeah? So you go home feeling really, really, really good, and we can come back and play tomorrow, that type of dog. And if you're not sure, don't allow your puppy to play. Yeah. But that said, people do. So I say, if after five, six seconds, your puppy's not wagging their tail, yeah? Your puppy's not going into play bear mode, yeah? And your puppy is sort of saying, I don't want to be here because they're 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 um, not really wanting to get too close to the old dog, then off you go. Yeah. Yeah? Um, because what will happen is it, 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 it could be called trigger stacking. Yeah. yeah. Um, not trigger stacking, sorry, um rubbing. Yeah. Yeah, you're more likely to flood your dog in a situation where the dog does want to be there, puppy does want to be there, but you're allowing them to stay together simply because of you want to see them play. Yeah. Um, I would also say, I think getting yourself a good trainer to come in and help you out would be the best way to go. Yeah. Because that way you don't get to learn any bad habits. Yeah. Yeah. From day one, you can start to learn how to bring your puppy up in a holistic way. Yeah. Because yeah? I think a lot of us think about dogs and we just see the outsides. Yeah. And now I tend to think of the internal, the, the brain and any how a dog functions um, 24 hours a day. So physical is good. The outer is nice to look at, but for me, the important, more important part is the internal part of the dog that we don't get to see. So Absolutely. getting in a good trainer who 
believes in holistic dog training is a way to go. Absolutely, because there's more and more of us out there now, isn't it, that are going the holistic way. So you can easily identify via their websites and their Facebook page and how they talk as well. So like you said about the brain development and things. So if you read in a, a, a blog or something or you're on a Facebook page and they're like, oh, critical periods, like that's really important, then that's the kind of trainer behaviours that you want to be going to. Um, there's nothing worse for me than when people turn around and say, well, my best friend got a puppy at the same time and they just don't like each other, but we're best friends and we go around to each other's houses all the time. And you're like, ah, because we know that just because they're best friends doesn't mean the puppies are going to be best friends. And it can be handicapping to one of the puppies or even both, can't it? Yeah, and, and that's become a more of a trend in this day and age. Years ago, you wouldn't hear people say, yeah, but I want to take my dog to the pub because we go to the pub regularly. Well, go to the pub and leave your dog at home. Yeah. Or go to the pub and you send the dog sitter. Yeah. Um, and that one that you just said, um, yeah, go around, we, we visit our friends every Friday, Saturday night, and, you know, you want to bring the dogs there. But well, maybe your dog doesn't like the other dog or vice versa. Yeah, yeah. so don't go to your friend's house. Yeah. It's more important, <laughs> yeah? And your friends can go out and have a good evening out and you buy a bottle of wine and stay at home. But times have changed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think that as we have evolved even with dogs and we've evolved into a nation of people that like to take our dogs to pubs and to cafes and to restaurants, and to the um, coffee shops, that's a quite popular one. Yeah. Um, and pubs, public houses. Yeah. Um, we are now living in dogs that are more fearful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, dogs that are more not wanting to um, venture out from their home because of bad experiences that happened yesterday and just being trigger stacked along the way. Um, and a lot of people might think this is controversial now because we have a lot of outlets that are welcoming dogs yeah that doesn't help exactly yeah now i'm not saying you shouldn't completely you shouldn't take your dog to any of these locations at all but first let's look is it appropriate for this particular dog how comfortable is my dog does my dog really like people yeah the happy to be around in an environment where it's quite hectic um, and, and even if I as an individual, I wouldn't take even my two to a local coffee shop, even if I was the only person sat in there Yeah, because I can't account for the, the, that person who's going to walk in and what's going to touch exactly yeah. Um, so yeah no, I totally agree because like with assistance dogs as well because you know about assistance dogs as well. With all these outlets being dog friendly, more and more assistance teams like me don't want to go out in public with our dogs because we're so frightened that our dog's going to be injured to a point where they can no longer work. And the trauma for them of like what they're going to go through. And then because so many people with assistance dogs have mental health problems or conditions, um, the trauma for them seeing their dog being attacked it's it's too much and it's frightening to people so if adults are afraid of taking out very well-trained dogs to these public places if we think about a puppy who's essentially a tiny baby that's absolutely terrifying for them isn't it it, it, it is and you see the thing about puppies and some older dogs is that people when we don't really um, truly understand what we're looking at we can totally get, not even convicted, have a perception that it's all okay because a puppy is playing or it looks like he's playing. Sometimes when puppies are actually what look like they're playing, it actually means I'm in distress. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how to handle this situation. So, yes, I'm wagging my tail, but I want to get out of here. Absolutely. Yeah? And that's because the, the carer, doesn't completely understand the whole situation in front of them. Yeah. Um, in other words, we're taking our dogs into situations for our own gain, as opposed for any gain that the puppy's going to get out of it, which is none. 
Exactly. And that's really important to be mindful of, isn't it? That it's for the human and their wants not and not even their needs. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely nothing to do with the puppy. It's about showing off and mm -hmm. it's the like puppies being a fashion accessory. Because I remember with Paris Hilton, I'm not very good with celebrities, but the blonde model celebrity in America, she got a chihuahua and I remember like when I was at school, she carried it around in a handbag. Then mm -hmm. suddenly everyone had chihuahuas and the idea was to carry around a chihuahua in a handbag. And a lot of people are saying like, oh, we've moved past that phase now. But we haven't because a lot of people aren't getting breeds for the breed. They're getting it for how they look and then showing the dog off. And these poor dogs aren't having their needs met because the guardians aren't correctly informed because... Like, it's easy to blame guardians, but then there's got to be a proportionate blame as well. So, like, we we know that the media is massively to blame. Like, every time there's a John Wick move, movie, you're like, please don't go out and get Malin Wells just because Halle Berry had two very highly trained ones. Mm -hmm. And every time there's a movie, I'm like, please don't go out and get this dog. But people are going to gonna do what they want to do anyway, aren't they? Well, they are. And in fairness to a lot of um, dog owners, it's the way life is. Yeah. We see, we want. Yeah. And so we go get. Yeah. And there is no law that stipulates um, going out to get a puppy, you have to go through a certain protocol. Yeah. Um, and, and if that were the case, I can't remember what part of, the, the, of Europe, is it Sweden or somewhere like that, they do have some kind of um, protocol in place before you get a dog. Yeah. yeah. Um, so until something like that happens, there is no law that says people can't go out and get the Halleberry dogs or the teacup dogs. Or the, yeah. It's just going to happen. And then we have breeders that actually breed puppies for those purposes, not so much for those purposes, but more because they know people are going to buy them because of that film that was on last year or this year. Yeah. Um, people are going to come to get the um, Husky because Game of Thrones... Yeah, you know, so let, let's just breed some more huskies, yeah, yeah, um, and it just goes on from there. Um, yeah. long gone are the days where I see the the, the old type breeds the Doberman, the Labrador, the, the Rossi, the German Shepherd, they seem to be pushed to one side, yeah, and a new age of dogs have just taken all over, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because like for me, my dog's wolf dogs, because I love anything German Shepherd. And I've been very open and honest about this that um like I always wanted to have a German Shepherd since being a tiny child, and German Shepherds was my heart dogs. Mm -hmm. But seeing the breed be destroyed in the nicest possible way, and then all the health problems and the fact that most of them only live to like seven or eight years old, they was getting a great dane for me. Like it's too much I know that hurt me too much to have a dog for such a short period so then that's when I came to wolf dogs and when I first got coded everyone was like oh because of Game of Thrones no for health because they're a relatively new breed that haven't been mucked about with too much that's why I've ended up with a wolf dog the same with yourself you you're a Doberman and Rottweiler person aren't you yeah and then Natalie's a Chihuahua person and People don't, like, we have a breed that we absolutely adore, but sometimes we have to stray away from it because of, like, health and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So would you like to explain, because you've just got Bailey as well, like, your journey with your breeds? I, well, <laughs> I, I, I started to really like Rottweilers around about the mid-90s. Um, but I was also a German Shepherd fan. I'm a huge German Shepherd fan as well. Yeah, anything German I like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when I say I'm a Rossi man and a, a Davy man, any German dog, I just adore them. Yeah. Um, so I had a German Shepherd back then, and um, Bruno was quite a reactive dog. He was. He actually was one of the reasons why I came into become a dog trainer. Yeah. Um, because at 12 weeks of age, at first I thought, yeah, this is a proper, proper dog, but this is when I only know better folks, so don't think um, I, I enjoy watching a 12-week-old puppy growling at people. 
um, now, but then I thought, oh wow, I'm just a proper German Shepherd. But something started to tell me this can't be right from one so young. Um, so it was Bruno that sort of got me to where I am today. And as I've gone through, the, learned more about him and more about his nervousness, um, and started to think, well, okay, that's not how a tall big car puppy should behave. Um, he's obviously emotionally distressed. Uh, probably I exposed him too much, too quick. Um, put him in position, um, situations that he was never going to handle. Yeah, um, having those people come over, keep touching his head, and what have you, um, didn't make him feel good. Plus, his from a genetic point of view, it wasn't good anyway. Yeah, um, and so I just made things worse without realizing. But having learned, as we do, and moving on, um, I then decided that the breed that I've always dreamt of, I will have for the rest of my life, Dobermans and Rotters. They're a fantastic breed, um, but I would honestly say they are not for the first-time dog owner. Okay? Um, if I was going to say which one would be, it would be the Rotty, yeah. but not the Doberman. Yeah. Um, they're a loyal breed, uh, more so the Rotty than the Davy. Yeah. Um, Dobermans are quirky, very quirky, very difficult to understand. Yeah, they're not the typical dog that comes running up to you uh, or strangers um, and the waggy waggy tail. That's more likely the Rotty. Yeah, believe it or not. Um, Dobermans, for me, a good rounded doby will meet people, for sure. But it's not one that's going to be wagging that bump. Yeah. Not until they really get to know you. Yeah. And when you get to know you, they are, they're, they, they become your best friend. Yeah. Um, my journey with them, I've learned so much from both breeds. Um, both breeds have taught me more about character dogs. Um, Rottweilers have most definitely taught me about how dogs can give you a how people's perception can be totally wrong. Yeah. You look at a Rotty, a lot of people don't realise they are part of the Mastiff family, yeah, that their look can be frightening, I do get that, yeah, but they are very, a very placid, laid-back dog, and if handled correctly, they are like teddy bears. Yeah. yeah absolute teddy bears. Um, they're also a dog that you're going to see a lot of way life, but it's not really way life. Yeah. That's just the way they look with those puppy eyes. Yeah. yeah. And even when they are four or five years old, they still have those puppy eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Those don't have puppy eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you never see the eyes, you never see them on white. If a dopamine gives you way like something's wrong, yeah, they just are serious, yeah. When my partner always says, My dopamine is like me, rude, <laughs> serious, <laughs> <laughs> and nothing phases them, yeah. Or a dopamine, whereas rock violas are completely the opposite, yeah. Working with them, again, I've learned a lot more so from the dopamine than from the rotty. Um, Dobermans are super smart. Um, you show them a few times and they don't seem to forget it. You might yeah. just show a Rotty a few times more, yeah, um, and then they will pick it up. But what I like about Rotties is if they don't want to do it, they don't. Yeah. Yeah. A Doberman will do it if there is benefit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that's something we need to. I've always taken into consideration when I'm training is that I think we've taken training to a level where we're not thinking about the dog anymore. Yeah. We're just training for the purpose of training. Yeah. Um, and I now have a different way of working. And um, if my baby's just come into our lives, baby's just been with us for two weeks and baby's seven months old. Um, and He's full of beans at the moment, yeah. But he's so I'm not doing any training with him, yeah. 
there is training, but it's not we set out to sit, stay, stand, and all this nonsense. Yeah, those things are just done through him just being close to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, I may just lure him into a sit as I give his street, but there are no words spoken. Yeah. Um, I may lure him out of that that sit just into a stand as I give him the treat again. Yeah. And what I've found in a few weeks, he's all well, just over a week, he's starting to pick up that behavior naturally without it being forced on him. Yeah. So he gives me those behaviors more natural. Um he's I can put this, he's still finding his way his way around his new environment. But I've learned so much from this seven-month-old puppy and in the fact that he's gentle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, he is gentle before he jumps on your head when you're in bed. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not so gentle. Uh, but it's like he's thinking, considering what comes next, yeah. how to, to manoeuvre next. Which I've never really taken much notice. I most certainly think of um, my um, rotting past. But with this guy, it's like dogs come into our lives for a reason. And, and when they come into our lives for a reason, you learn something new with that particular dog that you haven't learned with previous dogs, but you learn something with the previous dogs that you didn't learn from the other dogs. Yeah. And every dog is giving you something new to, to put, if you're a trainer, to put into your repertoire. And if you're a dog carer, um, I don't think dog carers, dog owners realise just how much experience and knowledge they really do have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, these guys have just, especially Zara has taken me to a place where, yeah, I am the type of trainer I am today because of her and yeah. we go past and this one for the present. Yeah. Uh, that's so important as well because, like, as you said, with Bailey coming into your life, he's been with you two weeks, he's now seven months old, and he did come from a stellar guardian before yourself as well. He just extreme change of circumstances that's another thing that's so important for people to learn because like moderating and do no harm and volunteering and we see straight away and we even get phone calls and emails rescued a dog want to do training straight away or the dog's not responding to cues and you know, your relationship and your bond takes precedent over anything else right now and that's something i think we struggle as well as an industry to get across to people and then they do retreat from us and then they do want to go to the trainers that will take the money and start training the dog straight away. But then what we start to see is that there's a breakdown because there's no relationship in the first place. So I think that's awesome that you're doing that with Bailey because it's the same for me with Zombie. So the photos of Zombie when he first came into my life because he was so nervous and shut down, he's just being cuddled on my chest all the time like a human baby. Because that's all Zombie could do. Zombie just needed that constant reassurance and touch. And then you saw, like, at the start of the podcast today, he's like, oh, you're busy and you're speaking to people. Let me just nick something. <laughs> yeah. Because he's a totally different dog now. But if I'd have rushed him into training and saying, okay, we're going to do this as a regimented basis, I think he'd still be a bag of nerves like he was. So I I'm really glad that you brought that up, Colin. You hit the man on the head with the R word relationship. Um, I think my clients get driven mad when I'm in a class. Uh, because if we can have a really good relationship with our dogs, one where our dogs can look at us and think, yeah, I just want to be with you. Yeah. I don't care what's going on over there. I just want to be with you. And they can get that from an age where, or oh, it doesn't have to be a puppy here, without nagging them to sit, nagging them to do this, nagging them to do that. The incentive of wanting to be around you is one of warmth, yeah, one of pleasure, as opposed to one of overwhelming them, yeah. always telling them, yeah, always wanting more from them. Yeah? And I think all of that comes more naturally when the dog decides, well, I enjoy being with you. Yeah, these behaviors become more apparent and a lot more easier to, 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 to be given as opposed to you having to teach them. And it's only when, I mean, like I said, Bailey came from, a, like you said, still a um, guardians before. Yeah, so I'll give Bailey another few weeks and then I'm going to take him out and we'll all start to organize them the league. 
Yeah. I'm going to let him off of that. Yeah. Um, which is funny enough, he's already started to do. Yeah. And it was, I think it was yesterday or the day before we were walking and he'd gone to the end of the lead. So I just stopped and he was sniffing and he looked back and said, oh, I think you want me to come back. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when he got his reward. Yeah. Yeah. And I can see he's always thinking, yeah? Now, when a puppy so young is actually processing and working things out, there's no need to tell them off because he's telling me quite clearly, I've got this. Yeah. But just give me a little space because I need to do this. Yeah. yeah? But I will come back. So that's the way I tend to work now and train instead of the regimental stuff. Yeah. And that we used to do, well, I used to do a lot of things in blue. Then you go to a class, it's walking around the hall, the sixth day, blah, blah, blah. We still do those things in our classes. Don't, I'm not saying we don't, because there's a place for them, but exactly. they've got to be appropriate, yeah, um, for the outside world, yeah. Exactly. Um, they've got to be appropriate. Yeah, but this is it, because, um, again, like with the relationship and stuff like and how you work with Bailey, um, my, no offense to Jamie, my partner, but he has to. If he takes dogs out, he has to put them on the long line because there's no relationship there. Because he's a typical goofball who will play fight with them, and that's it. And then he might be the guy who shares his custard creams with the dogs. Whereas with me, and we like if we go out for a walk together, like you've seen it in person, haven't you, Natalie? The dogs walk by my side. It's like, what you got for me? What are we going to do next? Where are we going? Oh, this is awesome. I'm going to sniff now. And you, there's like a communication stream going on. But uh -huh. Jamie still has to use that 25 foot long line because if he lets them off, they're like, I go do my own stuff now. So when guardians come to us and say, like, we're going to have massive problems with recall or X, Y, Z it's let's look at your relationship what does your relationship look like and then some people may get offended like but we have an amazing bond and it's like but can we tweak it a little bit more and make it a little bit more so that you're in communication with each other so mm. that's why i do like a lot of concept games and game based training because then the dog can never get it wrong mm -hmm. so it's not like um ah oh, it escapes me now uh, it's not like errorless learning. Mm -hmm. The dog can never get it wrong. So with game-based training, it's like if you use your problem-solving skills like Bailey's doing with you, mm -hmm. they've got that space and time to think they're doing something, but I need to figure this out. And it sets up their confidence skills as well. And because we're unpredictable, like they're not sure what's coming, but they're expected to problem-solve, then we've got that relationship flowing. And then it's there is a sheep over there, but whatever you've got, I can guarantee it's going to be a lot more fun. <laughs> yes, because whether we know it or not, adding value to us is important. Yeah. And the more we can add value without forcing that value, <laughs> makes a big difference. Yeah. I, I like it when a dog does something all on their own without me prompting or telling them, I think, wow. And I just reinforce that with a nice with a nice um, nice bit of chicken or sausage. Yeah. I believe dogs learn quicker that way. Yeah, absolutely. They retain that information of what they've just done, as opposed to you bellowing at them, forcing them into positions or things. It will take although the dog gives you those behaviours, it's not because they do it because they want to, they do it because they feel they have to. Yeah. yeah? So having a good lock solid relationship for me is important. Yeah? Absolutely. Was it, was it, sorry, was, uh, Bruno, you said, was your first dog. Yeah. So because you've been training for so long, which I think is awesome, you've seen completely different spectrums of it. So even back then, you recognised that Bruno's a German Shepherd puppy was extremely distressed with something, which mm -hmm. I think is really important because I see now a lot of German Shepherd guardians getting puppies and they're saying like, the puppy's growling, barking, and reacting to things in the environment. Um, so how would you guide guardians now who are getting these puppies who are, like, for lack of a better word, like having meltdowns in environments with communication and that kind of thing, like helping them to get along? One of the things I would say to any person um, looking to go out and get a dog, 
First thing is don't do proper research on that breed. Um, there's no point coming out with a gun dog and wondering why your dog's trying to run around the house with all stuff in its mouth. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's no point going out and getting a um, a garden breed and wondering why they're gargling, growling, and barking at people. Yeah. Um, if you get that part right and totally understand why dogs were bred to do what they do, then the puppy who's barking or growling at someone, you can take a stand back and say, is this natural behaviour from the individual or is this behaviour that is not coming, it's coming from more of an emotional standpoint because they are insecure, insecure and feeling overwhelmed by what's going on around them. If you understand that, then yes, you're more likely going to get along with your dog nicely. But I would say, don't go out and get a dog because you like the breed. Go out and get a dog because it will fit into your lifestyle. And you understand what they were originally bred for. And you're going to meet those needs. Yeah. Yeah? And you're going to meet those needs. Um, earlier on, I said I love all the German dogs, which is true. And a lot of them tend to be guarding dogs. Yeah. So having a guarding dog comes with um, implications. Yeah. Because they are naturally guarders, natural. Yeah. But he's only been with us for two weeks. But I do remember his um, previous owner saying to me, he's solid. Yeah. He'll let you know before they even knock on the door. He wasn't wrong. He lets you know before they even touch the door. Yeah. Um, and that's what Rico used to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so having dogs like that, yes, I allow him to give his bark. And now through uh, my silent behaviour, he barks, he looks back, and I now throw him that tree. Excellent. Yeah. Because I want him to just think, well, barking is good. But if I just bark once, him over there just throws me chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense, guy? Yeah, so there's the... training there, but I'm not forcing the training. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like creating a behavior through habituation, isn't it? So thank you for barking. Here's your reward. I've got it from here. And that's important as well because I don't think many dogs and puppies feel like their guardians have their back, especially with the German breeds or the livestock guardian breeds, because um, like I moderate for Kangal Scotland as well, which is another Facebook group purely for Kangals internationally. And sometimes when I see the, the, the dogs that people have got, and I'm like, why? You've gone for this breed as an aesthetic, but you don't understand the breed. And you'll see things like, I walked the dog today and they was going absolutely crackers at this person in the street and I couldn't hold on to them. And then you just like, I can't even read the rest of this. And it's so important to understand, as Colin's been saying, because like Kangal dogs, they're not a dog for the faint hearted. Like I've trained them since being 18 years old. My first professional case was with a Kangal dog who's badly abused, extremely reactive, and he hated member passion that no man was safe with this dog because he will bite and he will bite from being so traumatized and it took a good 18 months for this dog to start letting his guardian date men <laughs> um mm. because before that he was just so traumatized and they're big dogs like if you think rottweilers and dobies are big which they are like kangles are even bigger mm -hmm. yeah. and they're powerful as well aren't they colin they're a serious dog um I have been working with dogs for a very long time and I don't understand the kangal. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, I wouldn't go out and get one because they're big and they look nice. Mm -hmm. And I would have to do a lot of research and speak to a lot of people like self that have more experience with that breed um, before I even entertain the idea of thinking about getting one. Yeah. So it's really important. I mean, if we look at bull collies, um, bull collar puppies, we've got a few that have come through our classes of recent. And I can tell you now, both those pups like chasing the puppies. 
like chasing people, nipping the ankles. One of the reasons for this is because the outlook that their um, their needs haven't really been met. Mm-hmm. Those come from proper workers, yeah, working stock, and we're not giving them that living in the midst of London or Essex. They're not getting that being able to go out and herd. Yeah. Um, what those balls called? They like tribal balls. Yeah. Yeah. Um, getting those, letting them play with things like that. Those kind of games, yeah. Um, getting the mindset ready so that the mindset is being able to process, work things out. They're kept in our homes. Yeah. The needs are not being met, and the next thing you know, they are chasing cars. Yeah. I, I don't know how we stop that. Yeah. It's a lot, isn't it? And it's that this is how, like, us guys know professional listen as well, but this is how we end up with burnout and compassion fatigue. Um, because going back to my friend with the very first kangal I trained, when she bred a litter, she is one of the breeders that took the dog back at like three years old because not only was the dog, the dog kept escaping, but we found out the dog kept escaping because she was traumatised from the things that was happening to her at the home. And this person didn't understand the breed, but put everything correct on the application, said everything right at the interview, had too many dogs on a farm and the dog was being abused because she didn't understand the dog. But the dog was like, you know what, this is too much for me. And she was running away into the countryside because she was too scared. And when she came back to Debbie, it was so traumatic for both of us, seeing such a strong but gentle dog being so traumatised. And it literally took two months before she'd accept one of Debbie's other dogs to like go into the room with her. And how you said at the start about some dogs will literally handicap themselves. That's what her actual dad did for her. So not her mum, but her biological dad was like, I can see how sad you are. I'm going to handicap myself. And then Lily slowly started to come back out of the shell. And now she's absolutely amazing, but she's still extremely aloof, like you said, the Dobermans are, which isn't completely natural for a Kangal. Because as you said, they're such a difficult breed to understand because in Turkey when they get straight imported from Turkey mum dad grandparents and the whole line have been put out on mountains by themselves to guard sheep so we bring them into these homes in the UK of course there's gonna be problems like this is (laughs) what we have to understand and the German Shepherd is still very like a relatively young breed isn't it as well as like the Boxers and the Rotties and the Dobermans Because something else that really annoys me as well is I don't know if you've seen Bear, the Rottweiler, and his social media account, but Rottweilers have a natural growl, don't they? Rotty rumble. Exactly. That's the word. Yeah, that's it. And they do this as a sign of affection, and they do it as a sign of communication. But this guy is literally giving Rottweilers a bad name. So I just want to convey this across for Guardians because Rottweilers are dopey, awesome love bugs and I absolutely adore that and I've never personally met an aggressive Rottweiler they're just soft as grease but this poor dog is you know the growling looks super aggressive and then the guardians put him into a situation where he's like forcing him to have his teeth brushed and stuff and then you're getting people that think it's hilarious and then the other side where people are like really saying this is really dangerous, you've got children and that kind of thing. So could you explain more about, like, the Rottweiler growl? So I think each individual dog and their breed, their communication is really important. Rottweilers spend most of their life growling. Yeah, and a lot of it is about affection. Yeah. yeah. Even when they're playing, if they're playing with another dog, it sounds like they're a fight. Yeah. But all the Rossi said is, I'm enjoying this, I love this, this is so much fun, this is great. I don't want this to stop. Um, and people can misconstrue that for aggression. Yeah. Uh, and, oh God, if we go back to the 70s, they've had a bad rap since then. And that all started with the omen for anyone that's my age, um, 60 or older, or just a bit younger. Um, there was a Oh, what was it? There was a series on called The Omen with Gregory Peck, and the Rottweilers were in that were trying to be nasty, evil dogs. Yeah, obviously, people didn't realize these were well trained dogs. 
<laughs> to carry out a particular role. Yeah. Um, and ever since then, yeah, people were getting rock violence and they, they just had a bad black like, paper suit and no one touches them now these days, really. Yeah. yeah? Unless you're a Rotty fan. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, we can't, or we shouldn't, and people shouldn't, anyone listening to this, if you're looking for a specific dog, you can get help. You can ask a, um, a qualified dog trainer to come and help you, help them sit down with you, have a consult, and look what breeds would be more suited to your lifestyle. Um, instead of going out and buying um, or getting a dog that is going, or a rescue, um, getting a dog that's not going to fit in, um, has got his bred for a specific reason, and even if we got crosses, um, and you've got the understanding that it's a cross Labrador cross collie, think twice, because both those dogs need to have I need some air. Yeah, yeah, that's how I see it. Yeah? yeah, no, I totally agree, and I think it's really important because, like, I see. UK Rotty Rescue because I did really want a Rotty, but it just wasn't right for me at the time. And so I'm still a part of UK Rotty Rescue. And we see these Rotties all the time popping up and they've got such sad stories. And it's like, if people just researched before they went out and got this poor yeah. little baby, then they would like totally understand the breed. And then um, I worked for somebody who got not one, but two Rotties from the same litter. Didn't really do anything with them yet. And the first time I went, I was beaten to a pulp, not aggressively at all, but there was on a big piece of land because that's what it's like in Lincolnshire. And they were just like, oh, chew toy. And that's what it was. I got a hoodie on, it was winter, and it literally got ragged to death by these two teenage Rottweilers. And that's something else to understand as well. Like, if you feel sorry for the puppy that's not been purchased yet, no. don't just buy them because Rotties are so powerful. And this lady was literally in her 70s and very frail. Wow. So I had to go in like three times a week to help this person for a whole afternoon each time because the dogs were just like, hey, we're teenagers and we're big and we know it. <laughs> yeah. Um, to me, they're not breeds. There are lots of breeds, not just what Oh, no, 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 no. There are lots of breeds that are not first time dog owners. Yeah. Or four first time dog owners. And I think. Anyone looking to acquire a dog, whether it's through a breeder or through rescue, really needs to do some research. Yeah. Uh, and it's not a bad idea to get a, a trainer in to come in and sit to, to sit down, start looking at all the different breeds, yeah, and working out which breeds so you can bring it down to three or four, which breed is going to fit in with your lifestyle. Not necessarily the one that looks nice or the one that you like or the one that you want. Which, what do you need? Yeah. What's needed to be in your home? Um, and if that's a border collie, that's a border collie. Yeah, but it's got to work out so that everything is going to be ticking boxes before you get the dog and find out the boxes don't, can't get ticking. Yeah. Because yeah, there's no boxes to tick. It's just not going to work out. Um, and then there's the enrichment. Yeah. Uh, if we're not enriching, I mean, the breeds that I have, I'd say the Doberman needs it more. Yeah. Yeah. Dobermans for me can be quite serious in their outlook. Um, and because they are, well, I, I think, very smart dogs, if we're not working this, if we're not helping this, if we're not nurturing this, feeding this, um, that smart dog can become a very, 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 very depressed dog very, very quickly. And depressed dogs can start to display behaviours that are undesirable. Yeah. Um, I tend to find Rotties are a little bit so happy go lucky. Yeah. Um, the happy go lucky type of dog, not getting as much enrichment, doesn't get there as quick as yeah. the dogs that, that are more serious in their thinking. Yeah. The Tangle, for instance. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize there are breeds out there that are serious breeds. Yeah, they're not they're not in for play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're just here to do what they were bred to do and protect. But they're protecting this natural yeah. 
not necessarily desirable. Yeah. <laughs> and Absolutely. that's a really important factor. Yeah. But your girl communicates with you really well as well, doesn't she? Because I remember we was on the phone and then you said about you spoke to someone, someone else on the phone and you couldn't work out why she was still staring at you. And then you said it was because you left the scrambled eggs on the side. Uh, that still makes me laugh so hard. It, it was um, who first made me read? Leanne, you know, Leanne who runs the dog training college. Yeah. Is, She'd seen some videos I'd done. And it was the other time around and said to me, Yours are actually feeds off your body language. Yeah? If you go left, she goes left. If you take a step back, she just didn't go out and even talk. But just because you know, I'm a trainer um, and I would go there, I expected these behaviors. You think you're training them. It was quite interesting to see that she was actually feeding off what I was doing. Um, she's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she's not like I can just look at, and she's like she's really, really worked out what I'm going to ask her to do next. Yeah. Before I've even asked it. So that comes down to having a good relationship, and I love her to bits. She's a fantastic yeah. dog. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I love that. Um, and with enrichment, that brings us nicely round to scent work to talk a bit more deeply about that now, if if you want to. Um, so do you want to explain how you got into scent work? Because I know you're super mm. passionate about scent work. How did I get into scent work? What I've done is remember, I've always been fascinated about my dog sniff. I knew nothing about dogs then. And so while you say to the dog, come on, I've got to go, I've got to get to work, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. It never dawned on me how important it is for a dog to sniff. And it was, um, it was one of those old programs, TV programs, that was, oh, God. Yeah, they are so well known. They'll come to me because they were talking. And they were just talking about how it's important to allow dogs to go and get their um, internet fix, yeah? Um, how to get their pin now. And I was sitting there thinking, no, that can't be true, surely, yeah? But the more I watched that program and the more I then started, I need to learn more about how how that worked, then I became a geek. Yeah. Understanding how dogs actually have that seeking system, that, which is so self-rewarding, yeah. Um, made me then realize why dogs actually always got their bones down to the ground. Yeah. How they're collecting information, yeah? information that we will never see in our lifetime. Yeah. Half of that information will never even be able to sniff or smell ourselves. Yeah. Um, and, and even if I can see exactly what they're sniffing or smelling, well, I can't tell you the breakdown of what's in that, whatever it is they're sniffing or smelling. But the dog can actually say, wow, uh, I don't want to sniff that part of you, but I want to take this in. I want to carry on smelling this bit. So the dog's olfactory system is just amazing. Yeah. And, and if we can enrich every single dog, yeah, being allowed to just go out there and just stand at the end of the lead and let them sniff. And if this is the only time whilst they're sniffing, you can actually, if you have to, go on your mobile, let them sniff. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah? Because they're actually getting so fulfilled um, with pleasure, natural intrinsic behaviour, yeah, which I can't put it. I'm getting carried away here already. Actually, just makes them become positive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, from there I learned a little bit more about um, the olfactory system. And um, went on a course in the case of the dogs. Really love it. I was into it more. It's got a point now where you don't want to be talking to me about it because we'll be here for weeks. Yeah. <laughs> But scent work has also evolved, um, you know, because there are variations now. And when we're looking at puppies, so I'm not looking at giving a puppy full scent detection outwork or full workout, just using the nose, scatter feeding, hiding things, yeah, and allowing them to see what you've just hidden as you place it and you walk away and you just watch them go find it, yeah. 
because they're a little intrigued now. Why are we walking away? What were you doing over there? Yeah. And as you just place the hand out, take it there. And they go over and they find it. It's it's amazing to actually see a puppy, especially a puppy, when they got whatever it is in their mouth and they got it. <laughs> you didn't hide it very well. Uh, lots of dogs are very good at hiding things, uh, puppies, because they will hide things where they think they've hidden it, but it's right in front of you. Yeah, yeah. Um, puppies, just puppies. So when we look at scent work, I like to, with my own pups, just walk past a, a place where we're going to hide something. And at first, I want them to just see me place it in there. I'm going to walk off. And I want to walk around and see if he can remember or she can remember what, what just happened here. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Without me saying anything. I'm not going to even lure them into it or, or shape them into it in any shape or form. And it was amazing to see how Zara as a puppy would always remember what happened a few minutes ago. They said, hang on a minute, let's just stop here. What's in there? Wow, my comic. Yeah? Um, because I was looking to start off in the red comic. Because as we know, dogs have a very difficulty in understanding this in red. So then, going from the, the whole comic and then learning what I did on the Pacific Burn Dogs and Bronze, um, feeding her allowed her to have a comic and then break it all down. Um, and I did the side of that. What I would do with her is use teddy bears because she likes a teddy bear. And actually, the only thing she won't um, um, destroy. So I hid her teddy bear and asked her to go search. And I've never seen her search so vigorously on a red con as she did for her own thing. There was no need to put so because it already had been said, so she knew exactly what she was seeking to find. Um, I then just took it to another level because one of my trainers, um, Sarah, um, who was a former client, yeah, um, we then both went on another training um, course, um, the Silver. Um, and Sarah, who was a client with her dog, was quite reactive. Um, what should I say? Socially challenged. It grew. She became a trainer with me. Yeah. I don't know what I'd do with that, to be honest. She helps me run the business. And She's now become so geek. Yeah. Um, and just understanding that if we, even if, if the only enrichment we could give a dog is to allow them to go seek, yeah, that for me is it. Yeah. I don't think there is any better enrichment than a dog allowed to use his nose. Yeah. But like I said, it doesn't have to be all on scent detection. Yeah. Um, hiding things around the home. It's good. I'm just watching the dog, but the dog just go find it. Um, whether the dog picks it up or not doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be a full on um, indication. Yeah? It's about the use of the nose and the thinking. The, 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 the fun bit is when they find it. Yeah. Okay? The, the dopamine brush that a dog gets just to find that toy or whatever it is that you've, you've set out is what it's all about. Yeah. yeah. I don't think dogs get enough of that. No. Um, scatter feeding. Now, there's a good way to scatter feed. I like to have objects that are not edible with objects in there that are edible. Yeah? So I could have some, got some little square boxes there that are, you can just put them in your hand. And every other box has got a bit of chicken in it. Yeah. And as I throw them and scatter them out, and just watching even Bailey now going over to, and he does it quite quick. And he's once he stopped, I know he's got a box that's got chicken in it. Okay, it's how quick that olfactory system actually works. When yeah. a dog can actually work out, well, there's nothing in that one. Whereas you and I would have to pick it up, open it up. Oh, there's nothing in that one. That's quite time consuming, but we take dogs for granted. Yeah. yeah that there is a part of their anatomy that is so far more superior than man or any man, yeah? Um, if you've got 10 men together and ask them to go and find a specific height, we could take ages, 
the Arsenal one dog to go find that same hide. Um, and their system is geared up for it. They are ready, ready to go. And watching the dogs work, with, uh, especially the Copper Spaniel and Spirit Spaniel. If you want to get busy, just watch a Spirit Spaniel find something. There's a wizard in your and you think, they're not going to find that. They're moving too quick. But they're on it. Yeah. yeah. They're on it. Their nose is just so far superior. The other thing about sub work as well is it doesn't have to be, I've already said it doesn't have to be sent detection. But here's the thing dogs are detecting all the time. Yeah. And when they're looking for something, seeking for something, and they're finding it, um, they're not just finding it by luck. They're actually having to work to find it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for those of you that are not aware that dogs can inhale and exhale at the same time, um, speaks volumes because if we tried to uh, do either or either at the same time, we would keel over. Dogs are always seeking, always detecting, always finding. And yeah. we sadly interrupt them from doing that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You know, how many put your hands up in the past where dogs been sniffing and you pull them away from it? Yeah. Hands up when the dog's been there for five minutes and really getting into it's like us reading a book, another one. Yeah. And we turn those pages every three nights. Yeah. Every three We're asking the dog to turn their novel into a few seconds. Yeah. yeah. So if we just take the opportunity, the time to just allow the dogs, our dogs to use what they were created to do is use this yeah yeah and they may use their eyes to see the world but in reality they actually see the world through their nose yeah yeah i hope i haven't bored you to tears no no i love scent work well you know that we when we talk about scent work we can be on the phone for hours can't we because it, it, it's a passion yeah um one of the things that I'm looking to implement in classes on the Saturday now that we've got another venue is having not just puppies, but dogs just come in, yeah, and having a bit of free work. And they have what I now call my free set work. Yeah. And it's all intermingled, yeah. Uh, and all we're going to do is we're going to just sit down and we're just going to watch the individual dog or the individual pup go from one object to the next. It will also enable me to help people look to see if there is anything wrong with the puppy's gait yeah. or the dog's gait, um, what types of scents they are looking, they are more geared to, they are attracted to. Um, those that don't need too much in the sense like, because sometimes we can ask our dogs to do too much. Okay. And so those puppies and those dogs, we just make it easy. There, there's your fine. You're going to find that quite easy because I want yeah. you to do this again and again. And those puppies that think, well, I'm going to make it feel easy. You know, I'm a spring spaniel. I need mean, to really, really wrap it up here. Then we can give them something more difficult to do because dogs can be distressed equally as easy if something is too easy, yeah, as it is if it is too difficult, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Yeah. A dog who enjoying the seeking who comes across it quite quickly, yeah, finding the teddy foods that we're saying we're so quick, what do we do next? Yeah. So it's nice to see when a puppy or a dog is actually looking for something but finds it to match their what's the word, their ability, their preference yeah. and their ability, as opposed to making it too difficult to to earn it. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Because I remember nine years ago when I first got diesel, I signed up for um, Talking Dog Scent Work. So we went all the way to Nottingham and he was like six months old. Um, and Linda was saying the same thing. So she got out shoe boxes and that kind of thing. Then she sent you out with your dog um, and then you come back in and then the dog would go around the shoe boxes and stuff. And then, as you said, with the dogs that were very fast, obviously Diesel's a Spaniel cross, and he was picking up things really fast. She started to put the cheese around the banisters in the room. And then Diesel switched it up. So all the other dogs were like, oh, shoebox, food's in there. I'm going to open it up and I'm going to get it. And then Diesel would sit there and he'd be like, and it's there, and I'm looking up at you, and I'm, my little tail's going. So he was, like, naturally alerting straight away. 
And then on the banisters, he was just sat there like, oh, it's there. <laughs> so we had to give him the food. And Linda said it, um, said the same as you. It's amazing watching a Spaniel because genetically they yeah. will just offer that natural indication instead of like, poof. So they're like, it's there, it's there, it's there. Now give me my reward. <laughs> It, it, it's just a beauty, I and mean, you just reminded me of something. For anyone that's got dogs that, and I get this to him, this everybody, it's the zoomies. Yeah. yeah. We all know roughly where our dogs are created from, is undesirable indeed. <laughs> Depending on how big your environment is, how desirable, and if it's a big environment, it's quite desirable watching a dog zooming around. Good point. You can actually break that out with some scent work. Um, hiding bits of food around the house or yeah. hiding some toys around the house um, and we know it's now six o'clock around about ten to six just get them to go find all these things break it up yeah. um, and I find with clients that have done that it's actually worked a tree yeah yeah calm dogs dogs that are more settled of an evening um, dogs that have actually burnt the right amount of energy from the right place to the brain yeah as opposed to um taking them out for a run before they need the, you know runs down off to bed and the dog comes back home physically tired and at three four o'clock in the morning they wake up because they're bored yeah that's been thinking over so some work does help a, a great deal and i'm not sure how i forgot this if you have a dog that is socially challenged uh, a dog that is Scared of the world or scared of certain um, stimuli, stimuli, stimuli. They actually really do benefit from being able to use their olfactory system. Yeah. Um, in our reactive class, none of those dogs then go on to do cell work and vice versa. Yeah. And the feedback we get um, is, is pretty good in the sense that dogs, I'm not saying we cure dogs because, you know, a dog can be reactive throughout their whole life. A lot of it's going to be management. If we can help them and enrich that, enrich individual dogs, especially those that are socially challenged, they're going to have a much better outlook yeah. than one that's always been on a tight lead, on a, and always been um, pulled back, not allowed to sit. Set work is great for any dog, whether it's a young puppy who's 16 weeks of age, or has been more than given to do anything too strenuous, and we have to make sure that we're not working with a scent that is going to upset their nasal system, if that makes sense. Um, we don't want to give them anything too difficult, but for dogs that are older and are or what you term as reactive, I would say find your nearest scent class or find a trainer that can come out to you one to one yeah. and give you some scent games to play because there are so many different variations of a dog being able to use a nose. It doesn't have to be full on scent detection work. Yeah. Because you don't have to fall in love with scent work, do you? Or be super passionate. But even breeders now, instead of just doing early neurological stimulation, which is like the touch and things because their senses, aren't developed as soon as they're born, but their sense of smell is, they're now doing early neurological scent with them. So you could even ask your breeder about the different scent that they may have been doing with the puppy. So you can choose safe scents that the puppy's already used to, and then it's going to help that critical period of the brain developing. But as Colin's been saying, just let them sniff on a walk or point things around the house. You don't have to go like full on scent detective like us and be obsessed with scent work. Mm -hmm. It's so cheap because you, you can just use treats. So it's essentially free, isn't it, scent work? Or take them for a walk, let that lead go, and like you said, and then they're sniffing. It doesn't cost a penny at all, does it? But the value... The value is immense. And, and if you are someone that is going to add value to your dog's uh, exercising period... And let's just say if you get up and get, go out for five minutes before you take the dog out and go and do some hides, you could put a bit of apple somewhere, a bit of this somewhere, a bit of that somewhere, and, and then take the dog out. Just let them stumble across this. Yeah, it's all nice and safe and planned and managed by you. 
And as time goes on and you're making these little finds a bit more difficult, yeah, and you're adding it adding in a queue, whatever that queue may be, it's amazing. Yeah. That dog will go home before you then go off to work and oh, yeah. Exactly. So much energy. Yeah. You can't recommend um dogs using their nose enough. Yeah. And for dogs who are socially challenged and have big emotions, we also know that doing scent work heals the brain because they will enter into deep sleep and the brain chemicals are changing. And then the next time you go for a walk, if you leave them for a few days, then they're going to be more confident in going back out into the environment again. And as you said, like for socially challenged dogs, people get upset because their dog doesn't want to hang out with other dogs. But use an empty field. You can do so many things, a woodland, tree trunks, so, so many things you can do to make your dog's world so vast, it's going to be much bigger than playing with any other dog at all, isn't it? Well, absolutely. I mean, scent for me can also be, you, this is where a lack of long line comes into play. You go into a forest where there's going to be lots of sniffy smells. I think a lot of people call it the sniffar region. Yeah. And just let them go sniff. Um, dogs, when they are doing that for me, are decompressing, especially those that are socially challenged. It enables them to just cut everything else out. It enables them to function. Because yeah, I think when dogs are um, socially challenged, they're not functioning normally in, in normal time. But when they go out to do what they were naturally built to do is use their nose and gather information and feel get that feel good factor and they are decompressing and that's why it works absolutely absolutely um so colin did you want to just summarize what you said so someone wants about to go out get a puppy or go and rescue a dog what is the first thing that you're going to say to a guardian that's going to help them out before they even start looking <laughs> Research. If you're not sure how to do your research, um, hire a trainer. Hire someone that's a qualified trainer um, that can you know, can get together, sit down, and look at what breed, what type of dog, even size. I mean, I've forgotten mention size. Size is important. Um, so that everything fits in, and it's a dog that's you need more than the dog that you actually want. Yeah. Some people can be lucky to want that dog. I can't remember what they've done when I jumped and, and, and put it. But then I've put myself in a position where I can actually have that dog, if that makes sense. But not everyone's going to be, be able to do that. Research, get yourself a good trainer, and then go get your dog. Yeah, awesome. And then just work on building a relationship as you are with Bailey. If anyone tells you that just training, 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 for me, a dog needs incentives to be motivated. And the best motivating factor a dog can have is the individual that is with the dog 24 hours a day. So giving a dog a good incentive, building that relationship will make it stronger. Adding value to yourself and adding value to wherever you are, yeah, which makes your dog think, I don't want to leave something. But you can, you can go play. And that that that's usually there's nothing more walking around with your dog and your dog decides, but oh, uh, I was gonna come and play with you, but bad is here. Bye. That's that's brilliant. Beautiful. Excellent. Brilliant, Colin. Thank you so much. Um, how can people reach out to you and work with you, etc.? If you can just explain to people. If anybody wants to um, come to my classes, you can email me at Mike Romeo Charlie dot Spence, my surname, 63 at outlook.com. Or if you'd like to come and join my private Facebook group, it's Colin Canine Training Services, Colin's Canine Training Services dog group. Um, and we are also on Instagram, it's Colin's Canine Training Services. Awesome. So what we'll do is we'll drop the socials in the group after in the community groups if anybody wants your information. Mm -hmm. And Colin also does an amazing podcast, which I think we do need to talk about 
as well if you just want to briefly tell us about your awesome podcast Myself and uh, my colleague Patricia McGrady, um, we do a podcast called um, Dog Speak. Um, we have um, very, we've had quite a few varial, we've had quite a few guests on um, since last August when we first started. I think we're in a region now about thirty on podcasts, which I think is quite a bit for a short space of time. Um, and yeah, it's I really enjoy it. Yeah, we've had yourself on there. Um, we're going to get Natalie on there at some point. And then we're going to have to come down and drag you onto the podcast. Let's <laughs> get the mic in front of your face. <laughs> get on this. It's, yeah, it's fun. It really is fun. And if, you know, anyone listening to this, if you like certain topics, um, drop us a line and I'll ensure that we have those topics on the podcast. Colin is super approachable. Like, we all love Colin in the dog training industry. He's, he's an absolute oh, gem. Um and Colin is super approachable. Um, and if you do listen to Colin's podcast and you've got a passion for scent work or you want to learn more about it, the podcast with Kate Malatrat, where you, they're doing the prison scent work with Jamie Pound, that podcast. Kate Thorncroft. Kate Thorncroft. There we go. I'm terrible with names. That was an amazing podcast. Um, I knew about Kate and the prison before the actual podcast. Um, but it just goes to show the power of the olfactory system um, that we can now engage prisons um, and teach scent detection work. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, I it's, highly recommend listening to that episode because I absolutely loved it. I had to keep pausing it, taking notes, and then yeah. listening to it again. But if you are passionate about scent work, you think scent work is a sport you and your dog want to get into, whether you're a guardian. Or professional i highly recommend listening to that and then maybe looking at these guys socials as well because like colin myself dr robert hewins and the giants out there in scent work learn from as many different people as you can so yeah. i began with talking dog scent work and then i found dr robert hewins yourself jamie pound there's so many people who teach so differently as well and it's all just knowledge that's going to contribute to your toolkit so, well, thank you so much, Colin. It's been awesome to speak to you, as always. Um, <laughs> and we absolutely appreciate your time as well, because we know that you're very busy. That's okay. It's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you. So, guys, have a great fortnight and a bank holiday weekend, and then we'll be back in two weeks. And this time, I'm going to be talking and getting interviewed by Natalie. So, for the first time, you can grill me about stuff. Bye.